Okay. Um, I just want to make sure I have the go ahead from Joe to start. Yes, go ahead. Great. Okay, thank you. Just want to be sure. Um, okay, so um, I'm Julia Wolf uh, here with my incredible colleagues, um, all composers. Um, so I just want to welcome everyone to our panel um, on common women of women of note. Nice pun there. You didn't catch it. Um, and I wanted to start by just saying that I'm thrilled to be joined by this extraordinary group of artists. Um, and they are, let me just make sure I can see everyone at the same time so I can say it. Joan Tower, Tanya Leon, Jesse Montgomery, Missy Mazzoli, Laura Schwendinger, Zosha DeCastri, and I think I got all the composers as well as Joseph Fender, who's, who's assisting us here. Um, and um, just also to say a huge thank you to the Aspen Music Festival, in particular to Joseph, to, to, sorry, to Joseph Fender for bringing us together, um, you know, to exchange histories and ideas. Um, I'm going to make a few opening remarks, and then I will address a question to each panelist to get us started. Um, and then we're going to leave some time at the end for some questions. Um, I wanted to start by saying that um, it's interesting that I'm chairing this panel because really in a certain sense, this is like my least favorite subject, but in the most positive sense, in the most positive sense, in that um, the idea that we're still discussing the issues surrounding women composing is really almost shocking to me, right? So we are composers, we are artists, we are all different from each other, we are bold, we are innovators, so why you may ask, is this uh, issue of being women uh, composing still being discussed? Well, it wasn't very long ago when there were practically no women composing. So uh, many of us were the only women in our composition programs. There were basically no women on composition faculties. Um, and today things look very, very different. Um, my father was a kind of old fashioned feminist. He was a bit distant and formal, but he somehow communicated his belief that I could accomplish anything I set my mind to. And he had hoped that I would consider medicine, which he would uh, respectfully, so he respectfully can, can refer to lady doctors entering the field. Okay, so nobody today would say lady doctors. So all of my doctors are women, even my dentist is a woman. Okay, so why do we still hear this term woman composer? You know, I mean, and why is it that if you have a concert that has a program with all women on it, it's a woman's concert? You really, you, I don't think you'd hear uh, a concert referred to as a men's concert if it was all men on the program, right? So this is a little odd. Um, yet still, we have come a long way. And everyone on this panel is a celebrated composer active in the field. Um, we, the collective we, are writing chamber works, orchestra works, writing oratorios, operas, making sound installations, forming our own ensembles, what else are we doing? <laughs> Writing librettos, addressing political subjects, starting festivals, and much more. Um, everyone on this panel has served as a mentor, um, and many of us teach at universities and head departments or are, are emeritus. Um, this panel represents a multi-generational group of artists. Each, uh, each pan panelist is going to, um, first of all, each, each panelist is a leader, is a true leader in the field. Um, and I'm going to be asking each person an individual question. That way we can hear from each person, like, you know, kind of a short moment with each composer. Um, and then we're going to open it up to questions and have a little more of an open forum discussion, which should be fun. So I'm going to start with Joan Tower, and we will end the individual questions with Tanya Leon. So two magnificent composers who have paved the way for all of us. So those are our bookends. Um, Joan, you're on deck. Uh, so Joan Tower is widely regarded as one of the most important American composers living today. During a career spanning more than 50 years, she has made lasting contributions to musical life in the United States as composer, performer, conductor, and educator. Her works have been commissioned by major ensembles, soloists, and orchestras, including the Emerson, Tokyo, and Muir Quartets, soloists Evelyn Glennie, Carol, Carol Winchek, David Schifrin, Paul Neubauer, and John Browning, and the orchestras of Chicago, New York, St. Louis, Pittsburgh, Baltimore, Nashville. Oh, she has some, like the whole list of hundreds of thousands of orchestras. Um, and Washington, DC, among others. Um, in 1990, she became the first woman to win the prestigious Graumeyer Award for Silver Ladders, a piece she wrote 
for the St. Louis Symphony where she was composer in residence from 1985 to 1988. Joan is currently writing a new concerto, I have this right, for the brilliant cellist Alicia Weilerstein. And is that for the New York, which I don't know which orchestra that Joan's going to tell us. No, but it's for Alicia. And you have to unmute yourself. So we need to unmute Joan. It's a festival. It's for a festival. Okay, so Lisa is the soloist and it's going to be for a festival. Okay, great. Um, okay, here's your question, Joan. Okay, you got out the machete and carved a path for us all to follow. Can you give us a snapshot of what it was like entering the field? How, this is a little bit longish way I'm phrasing this, but how did you imagine this path for yourself without clear role models? And how did you maintain sanity and your incredible spirit in the process? Okay, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> like five days. You know. <laughs> no, first of all, snapshot, Julia, snapshot. <laughs> first of all, Julia, you should have gone into medicine. You know, I, yeah, I know. Much dad, more money. <laughs> yeah. Second well, of all, today is a little scary. <laughs> yeah, I'm very honored to be on this panel that you put together. It's a wonderful thing to do and to talk about still because it's not a problem that has been solved. But when I started out in the 60s, things were very different because there were no role models. At least I didn't know about them. And I was in Columbia University um, where I was studying the history of music and there were no women in the books. And there were very few um, uh, performers too. The orchestras were still largely men. That's all of that has changed dramatically. <clears throat> and when I started out, I didn't actually know. I didn't realize I was a, a, a rare be beast. I just didn't know that until the consciousness raising moment of the sixties and seventies. And so all of a sudden these radical and not so radical feminists started coming out and making demands and changing the whole scene of uh, politically, you know, why is it unequal pay? Why aren't there no women in the, on TV or in the, in the papers, journalists? It, it was a very different scene and they started cutting through that scene. And then um, I started reading all these books uh, uh, and it, because suddenly I, I started like raising my own consciousness, wait, wait a minute. And I started looking around at me and there were no women around. I was the only woman on the panel. There were two women, Louise Talma and Miriam Gidding, who used to came, come to all our concerts. And uh, I said to Mir Miriam, said to me, I said to Miriam, would you write me a um, recommendation for a Guggenheim? She said, certainly. I got it. And I went back to her and she said, now you can write one for me. And she was <laughs> 36 years older than I was. And so little bits of information like this started to creep up more and more and more. And I started to become very. very Jen, you're knowledgeable. Uh oh. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, you're back on. Okay. Nancy Rice changed my life. She's a feminist musicologist. Now, this is when the musicologist started to come forward. She wrote one of the definitive biographies of Clara Schumann and at that time we had no biographies of that kind of depth and so there were a whole slew of them at that time for um, Seeger, Amy Beach, uh, Fanny Mendelssohn and so I started being educated about this whole history and there were also a lot of music festivals devoted to women in music and I went to all of them because I wanted to know what this history was. I really, because it impacted me personally and it meant so much to me. Well, it changed my life basically to, to wake up to all of this. Um, and uh, I became a kind of a feisty panelist. <laughs> I would walk into the room and then say, okay, the women, men would go, uh oh, Joan's here. Where are the women? Uh oh, uh oh, do we have any women on this list? <laughs> I became very feisty and I was, I, I felt good about it too, you know. Uh, um, I think actually during the last couple of years, it, the, the impact has increased because of the At Me Too movement. That has had a significant, even more significant effect 
on the freedom of choice of women. Um, and I, I say this because last year I'm almost done. I'm four minutes and 15 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Last year, I got these awards, big time awards, three of them. I think and I missed the intro. Yeah, yeah no, was your, the one you got, the Musical America thing that oh, Julia yeah, got. Right, that's right, 2020. I got that. Yeah. Year. That's right. And then the Gold Baton from the American Symphony Orchestra League. Wow. I was like, what? And the Chamber Music Award. And I was like, this is, this is what's going on here? It was the at me too moment because what happened, I mean, I don't mean to be so cynical about it, but I'm very honored to be getting these awards, but everything you get is, is culturally behind it. There's a culture behind it. And I know that being a panelist for so many years, and I think it's very important for us to know that history and not to take it for granted at all. So 511. John, that was Five great. Minutes left. <laughs> it's so it's so valuable to hear um, to hear the history. You know, I, I don't know if anybody saw Mrs. America. It's pretty entertaining, I have to say. But it, it it's a little snapshot. Gloria Steinem, you know, Phyllis Schlafly, remember her, um, Bella Abzug, and um, you know, just I love that you tied it to uh, the world. You know, like we are a part of the world. We're not just this little, like elite niche over on the side. We are responding to to what the histories are, and and incredible to hear your. Your beginning and I didn't know that. Yeah, I don't know if any of us knew that 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 was such an important part of your, you know, like opening opening your mind. Okay, uh, moving right along. <laughs> Being very efficient here. Um, so I'd like to go to Jesse Montgomery next. Um, Jesse Montgomery is an acclaimed composer, violinist, and educator. She's a recipient of the Leonard Bernstein Award from the ASCAP Foundation, and her works are performed frequently around the world by leading musicians and ensembles. Um, many to name, uh, but her music interweaves classical music with elements of vernacular music, improvisation, language, and social justice, placing her squarely as one of the most relevant interpreters of 21st century American sound and experience. So Jesse, thanks for joining us. Um, and she's currently writing a new work for the New York Philharmonics. I'm just I'm actually mentioning the work that people are you know, busy creating at the moment. Uh, so Jess's work is for the New York Philharmonic, with a, it's, which is a multi-movement suite of songs and dances relating to perception of color. So Jesse, is there more work to be done? <laughs> In oh boy. <laughs> yeah. In particular, yeah. um, do you perceive that you were treated differently from your male contemporaries? Have you hit any barriers in defining your presence in the field? Well, thank you, Julie, for that question. Um, yeah, it's um, and and it's it's really interesting to follow um, Joan's remarks um, in this particular moment. Um, you know, I, I have to say um, that you know what we're talking about is a politicization of your identity um, within the field, right? Where our identity as women and myself as a black woman being politicized um, in order to um, sort of make an example for where we are um, in the world. Um, and that's a really hard burden to, t to, to take on um, when you're trying to be creative. Um, and so that's, that's something that, um, although things have really changed um, immensely in terms of representation as we have this amazing panel um, in front of us and then all the countless other uh, female composers that I've gotten to know and admire um, throughout, you know, along my short career, um, I, um, you know, it's it, the, this um, idea of representation being really an important step um, and an important factor um, in, in gaining people's consciousness. That's such an important thing um, to, to be a part of, um, of course. And, but it's, 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 incre it's tremendously um, burdensome to have to um, always be representing um, something, representing a public consciousness, right, all the time. Um, and so that, that um, I, I, I think that in terms of where we're going, um, we all are still sort of, we're all taking on that, we're all still sort of taking on that, that responsibility. Um, and I would like to see uh, us in a place where we're able to really be free 
um, in our in our art and and to not necessarily be making some kind of political statement if we don't if if it's not necessarily a part of your um, ethos. It's also really hard to write a piece about being a woman. I don't think that that's I think that's like a really I mean, it can be a story that you're aligned, you know, that you're creating narrative that has a women as a subject. But in terms of like music itself, it's a really hard medium in which to express femininity, so, as so it is. Um, and it's not something, you know, um, that anyhow. So I think that just our our presence um, in the field, um, hopefully, and 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 it increasing and in an increasing amount, um, continues to remind people that um, there is a wealth of creativity out there among all of us composers, um, no matter what our sex or religion or ethnicity may be, um, that it's something that we um, can continue to just celebrate on a human level. Um, yeah, and I, you know, it, it's, it's, Joan, I, I, I um, I'm really inspired by what you said about taking that moment to really educate yourself um, about your own history and where you sort of happen to plop down in, into it. Um, I feel that happening right now with Black Lives Matter movement. I know we're in a discussion about women in music, but it's all aligning. Um, and um, this, this, this moment has been really, really, truly a moment for, my, for me to look at who's there, who has actually, who's, who do I know from the top of my head, um, who's a black, you know, a black composer or a black female composers in particular, um, and um, who am I missing? And it's a, my, my off the top of the head list was really painfully short. I made, I, I went through that exercise a couple of weeks ago and I thought, oh, there's only like, you know, there was like, 12 people on my list that I could call from the top of my head, you know, in a matter of minutes. And I thought, okay, well, that's, that's not, that, that's clearly not, you know, that's, there's something missing here. And I mean, I'll have to say my list spanned a couple of hundred years. Um, just, you know, luckily um, being, having learned about these composers over the years, but um, really um, taking, taking measure of where, like where it is that you happen to end up in this stream of social consciousness um, and development is so important in terms of like, and then it can, allows you to sort of, to approach your work either, you know, invested in that work that you just did, or you can abandon it and say, this is totally my thing and I'm gonna um, go and do it this way, you know, uh, with, you know, with, with a better informed, um, you know, consciousness. So. I think, you know, I think that's where, I think that's where we are. We're sort of like realizing what's happening and then hopefully we can go, uh, you know, start to kind of turn the dial um, ever so, ever so continuously forward <laughs> um, as we, as we sort of op open our minds to, to what's going on. Jesse, thank you. That was so articulate. <laughs> I mean, I related to what I was saying uh, in my bumbling way um, about that we're artists, you know, and, and I think just the point of having agency to make those decisions is where, is what your hope is. What is yes. What hope is sure. that, we're, um, you know, this combination of education and awareness, uh, but then ultimately um, being the free, the free spirits we all are, the free artists that we all are, you know. Exactly. Um, so that's that's really important not to be yeah. pigeonholed, you know, and, and feel set. Right. And, how right. and what does it mean to be pigeonholed? Right. It's like a no, it's like a, you, you, even as a, you know, young person, let's say coming up, it's like you hear these catchphrases and say, well, I think I identify with that thing of not wanting to be pigeonholed. But what does it actually mean? You know, and those kinds of things. So, yeah, important, really important to address. Yeah. Um, OK, thank you. Um, Okay, I'm moving along here. Okay, in recent times, women have been taking the opera world by storm in how, not only writing music, but in how characters are portrayed, what subjects are chosen, and the question of who is now telling these stories. Um, both Missy Mazzoli and Laura Schwendinger have presented particularly strong female roles in operas. I'd like to begin the discussion with Missy and then follow up with Laura. 
Um, merci. Um, Missy Mazzoli is the Mead composer in residence at the Chicago Symphony, and her music has been performed all over the world by the Cronus Quartet, Eighth Blackbird, pianist Emmanuel Axe, Philadelphia, Scottish Cincinnati, New York, and I think a few more than that operas. Um, in 2018, she became one of two first women, along with composer Janine Tesori, to be commissioned by the Metropolitan Opera. Works for orchestra have been premiered by the LA Philharmonic, the Detroit Symphony, among many others, uh, along with composer Ellen Reed, this is an activist. She founded Luna Lab, which is a unique program that provides mentorship and performance opportunities to young composers who are female identifying non-binary or uh, gender non-conforming. Missy is currently working on a new opera titled The Listeners, which will be premiered in March in Oslo with the Norwegian National Opera and will come to Philadelphia Opera. Missy and I are from the same town, near our hometown, well, like our adjacent towns, tiny town in the middle of Pennsylvania. Um, uh, okay, and so it comes to Philadelphia Opera in September 2021. Um, Missy, in your own work, do you think about strong female roles? Um, does this influence the subjects you choose? And do you think women are changing the landscape of subjects addressed in opera? Um, thank you for the question and, and thank you for um, inviting me to be part of this. This is really awesome. Um, you know, every woman on this panel has changed my life in some way. And it's just not only an honor, but it's really just so energizing, especially at this time to just see all of your faces and um, talk about music with you. It's really um, such a joy. So thank you. Um, so yeah, I know I, you know, thought, um, have thought a great deal about your question and was actually, I found myself hitting some walls in thinking about how women uh, think about female characters. And I was like, why is this so hard? You know, I live and breathe opera. Um, I am, you know, an activist and a feminist. And I think about women in music all the time. Like, why am I having such a hard time thinking about this? And I realized that, you know, we just don't have a large enough sample size to be able to say women write anything that women women write this way or tend to write their characters this way or this way. Um, and so like Jesse did, you know, I did the math in terms of my history of seeing operas by women and realized that I have seen eight um, operas by women in my life. And again, I'm someone who goes to the opera every opportunity that I can. And I feel like it's my job to seek out new work. Um, and I've seen hundreds and hundreds of operas by men. So just to, just to give you an idea, you know, it's not numerically sound, you know, to draw any conclusions based on so few works. Um, and I just, I do want to just quickly list them if you want to bear with me for a second, you know, so, uh, you know, the operas that I've seen by women are Ellen Reed's Prism, uh, Kaya Sariajo's L'Amour de Luen, um, works by Bang and a Can and you, Julie. So, you know, including oratorios like Fire in My Mouth, um, works like Shelter and Lost Objects, Jennifer Higdon's Cold Mountain, works by Paola Prestini, Meredith Monk's Atlas, Du Yun's Angel's Bone, and then um, so a couple short works by Emma O'Halloran. That is it. And I've studied a lot of works by women, you know, works by Janine Tesori, um, Tanya Leone's uh, Scourge of Hyacinths, um, Ethel Smythe, The Wreckers. So, you know, there, so there are, there is a history there, but um, you know, it's, it's small, it's small, especially compared to all the works that are celebrated uh, that are written by men. Um, so, you know, in, in these pieces that I've listed, you know, there are wildly different female characters and there's really no one thread that connects even those works other than the gender of the composer. Um, you know, but these, even just looking at this small uh, number of operas, um, there are, I would say that these composers do give us characters that are more complicated and nuanced than many female characters in traditional rep. Um, so thinking specifically, you know, of Ellen Reed's Prism, which explores a complicated mother-daughter relationship in the wake of a sexual assault, uh, Meredith Monk's Atlas, based loosely on the life of a female explorer, Alexander David Neal, um, Du Yun's Angel's Bone, which features a sadistic woman who gets her sense of power because she's trapped two angels in her basement and decorates her hair with their feathers. Crazy, love it. Um, and I think that these are strong characters, but I think maybe the better word is complicated multifaceted, uh, you know, sometimes harmful, sometimes empowering, sometimes all of those things in one aria. Um, and this is in contrast to the history of, of the way women are portrayed in opera 
um, and where they often feel symbolic. You know, they're only able to show one side of their themselves. They're the love interest. They're the betrayed woman, uh, the evil sorceress, or the goddess who is eventually the love interest. I mean, it's like that's you know there are many exceptions, but this is um, this happens a lot. So. You know, I, you know, and just thinking about this, you know, if we can zoom out for a moment, I think that the reality is that so many viewpoints are excluded from the world of opera um, and have been since the beginning. I mean, opera is the domain of a very small group of wealthy white guys. <laughs> and, you know, and when we open it up to the remaining, you know, 90% of the population will inevitably see uh, more nuanced and complex characters that reflect a diversity of experiences. And that means opening up to women, uh, composers who are not white, indigenous composers. I'd love to see more trans composers writing opera. I mean, the list, I could go on forever and ever with that list. Um, so in that sense, I do feel that if we continue to open the field to women as we have been, um, you know, thanks to many of the women on this panel, uh, we will see a wider array of female characters. Some of those will be strong, some of those will be wildly messed up and mean. <laughs> and I don't think that we'll necessarily see women as the heroines of all opera composed by women. And I don't think that women will be safe from dying in operas written by women. Um, and, you know, I just to speak briefly about my own experience, you know, I personally am interested in dramatizing the experience of women in impossible situations as a way of provoking discussion or thought about the way that women exist in the world the contradictions we face, the obstacles, the difficult choices that we're asked to make every day. Um, and I actually got a lot of criticism about my first two operas, Breaking the Waves and Song from the Uproar, because they have at their core, um, women who are very strong, but also make really bad decisions, part of an intense relationship with a man, are definitely complicated, and then they die in the end. And there's also an element of violence uh, in, in those two works. And people asked why I, as a woman, would make an opera in which bad things happen to women. And I would go back to my original point, which is, you know, how can you make any assumptions about what women are going to write when you have so few operas uh, to base that opinion on? Um, and also, you know, my work is an extreme dramatization of these experiences that women have all the time. And being that opera takes everything to an extreme, that means the character might suffer and the character might die. Um, and I, you know, there's this common refrain, you know, that opera is the undoing of women, the Catherine Clement, um, you know, uh, quote, the thing that's often quoted from her. And I, I, I just, I think that's wildly reductive, you know, and I think that we need to look at um, the way women are treated in opera, but, you know, a death can mean many things on stage. You know, a death on stage can mean transcendence. It can represent a refutation or a condemnation of the world around that person. Um, you know, in, in my operas, you know, in, in my opera Breaking the Waves, uh, and the main character Bess um, dies because it's a representation of the fact that she's too good for the morally corrupt and petty community around her that doesn't understand her relationship with this, with her husband. Um, and in my opera Proving Up, my third opera, um, the, the, the central um, female character also dies um, and her death is symbolic of the failure of the American dream for her family. Um, so just, you know, in conclusion, I think that any opening up of this field will see um, a wider array of characters and diverse viewpoints. I really look forward to that. Um, but we have to be careful not to put expectations on women of what that will look like. Um, you know, let's not expect women or anybody to write operas with perfect female characters. Um, let's not expect them to single-handedly redeem the shortcomings of a 400-year-old art form. <laughs> um, and again, as Jesse said, you know, let's not uh, I think you put it so beautifully, like don't put pressure on us to represent the public consciousness, um, especially in one work. You know, I feel like we're often, we write an opera and then you're expected to solve all the problems of um, sexism wow. and racism, everything in that one piece. And if you don't do that, then you're opening, you're open to much more criticism than your male colleagues. Um, so again, you know, my life's mission is to open up um, classical music, and in particular, the operatic art form to all voices. But this really means allowing us that freedom, uh, letting us, letting people of diverse viewpoints come to the table with their ideas of what stories should be told. Fantastic. Yeah, I love, I like, I hadn't really thought through that idea of complexity of the character. You know, I mean, I think that's, you know, a really important point that it's not two dimensional and it's not stereotypical and um, and you know it sort of made me wonder about you know like writers you know all the great writers George Eliot who had to be called George Eliot because that wasn't her real name um, 
Um, and and what they brought to the conversation, you know, there's uh, you know, I'm not <laughs> super literate in, in every uh, book written by women, but but it seems like there might be some really interesting parallels to what the expectations those women may have had for themselves or and what they were doing. But certainly the rich, incredible. I'm a George Eliot in that. Okay, so the rich uh, um, storytelling they brought to the table, and um, but and. and Take, picking up from your point of bad things happen to women. <laughs> okay, it's a very good segue into Laura, um, who I think is going to be addressing some of that in, in her conversation. Um, okay, so on to Laura Schwendinger. Okay, the first composer to win the Berlin Prize, Laura Schwendinger's music has been championed by artists Don Upshaw, Matt Heimovitz, the choir of Trinity Wall Street, Eighth Blackbird, Jenny Coe, and Janine Jansen, among many others. Her music has been featured at venues, including Carnegie Hall, the Kennedy Center, Alice Tully Hall, Wigmore, Wigmore Hall, and many more. She's currently working on several pieces, including a new work for two violins, an orchestra called Nightingales, featuring sister violinists, Eleanor and Alice Barch, as well as a large-scale theatrical work entitled Into the Night. Laura, in your opera, Artemisia, Artemisia, we were talking about how to pronounce it earlier. Um, you tell the story of 17th century artist Artemisia Gentileschi. Uh, this seems to be a very early Me Too story, like way before. Um, um, did you think about how this history resonates, this history of, of Artemisia resonates? And you can tell us the story so everyone is familiar with her. I just you know, looked her up to see what her complete um, history was. Um, but were you thinking about the resonances with the Me Too movement today when you were writing it, or was that just kind of like God, something you realized afterwards? Um, just tell us a little bit about entering into that subject. Well, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, excellent. Okay. Um, yes, I mean, Artemisia Gentileschi was the first Me Too, arguably the first Me Too movement woman. Um, born in the 1600s, she, she was a follower of Caravaggio. Her paintings were phenomenal. She was the first artist that was accepted into the, the Academia um, in Florence. And um, so she was part of the academy with all of these men. And um, her work was dramatic and, it, and it, it portrayed women in a very realistic way. All our folds, our fat, our, you know, everything that makes us women, right? Um, unlike male painters that, that of the period that would paint women um, with the sheen of beauty, you know, that always everything had to be perfect. And, you know, who can live up to that, right? That's, that's, that's something that we think about constantly. You know, I have conversations about, um, you know, with my, my colleagues about, are you wearing makeup when you're doing your Zoom sessions with your students? <laughs> You know, are you fully dressed? Like right now I'm wearing my slippers, right? <laughs> that's, that's the kind of um, questions, you know, that, that come up. And of course, Artemisia became famous for the wrong reasons after. Like men write the histories, right? So Artemisia was famous in her time. She was painting for kings and queens and uh, patrons of, of, you know, that were bishops and, and the most kind of, um, wealthy, interesting people that that you could imagine, and um, was painting everywhere, not just in Florence, but also in Rome. She had a career in um, England where she painted for the king there. Um, but then, you know, about 50 years later, she was almost forgotten. And, um, and it's because men write the histories. And so um, she became famous because she was raped. And she was raped by a man named Augustino Tassi, who was her um, art tutor. And he tutored her in perspective. And um, at 16, she was raped by this man while she was taking an art lesson with him. And, um, and that changed her life. Her father sued him, took him to court, and he went on trial. And during that trial, she was actually um, um, subjected to torture to verify her testimony that she had been raped by this man. And at the end of that trial, he was found guilty. Tassi was sentenced to prison. He was wealthy, so during that time you could kind of pay your way out of things, right? So he never served a day. What not that typical? 
right? That even resonates with, with us uh, today, you know, and this week. <laughs> and um, um, so she became famous because of this rape trial. And then it wasn't until the last about 50 years that her, her whole reputation started being looked at again. And they realized, oh my gosh, this woman is the greatest painter of her time. Not the greatest woman, but the greatest painter. And that's the thing, we do this cycle of rediscovery every 50, 100, 20, you know, whatever. It's a cycle where we say we're going to commission a bunch of women composers or we're going to, um, you know, do major exhibits on Frida Kahlo or on um, Artemisia Gentileschi, like the National Gallery of Art in London has, was supposed to have the summer. And in fact, my opera was supposed to be done there in July like right now, but of course we're not traveling. So, um, and what, but, but that once that cycle, once that excitement happens, there's a lull and that lull, um, um, it, it, it's, it's not a healthy cycle. It's a cycle where not only does discovery come, you, you commission, you know, Jesse Montgomery for a piece, right? But then you keep her in the repertoire. And you don't, you don't do this thing that, that happens where you have a major exhibit and then you don't put you know, Frida Kahlo's works in the gallery. So I was shocked. I, I go to Paris quite a bit because um, we have some family there and con some connections there. And um, I go to the Louvre, I, I would say two to three times a year. I'm very lucky. That's a very one of my happiest moments every year. And um, I realized um, one day that there were no Artemisia Gentileschi's in the Louvre. There's a giant canvas in the Met Museum in New York, but not in the Louvre, you know? And why, how, how is that possible? Her father's painting, and in fact, her visage is in her father's painting is in the Louvre, one of his paintings. But um, it's that kind of thing that has to be remedied. It's the, it's the folding in of women's voices and the great women's voices. And I, I tell this little story that's I think really relevant here. And that's that um, I run a contemporary ensemble at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And um, every year I make sure the program is at least half women. And, um, and, and also women of color and men of color, you know, because this happens to men of color as well. People like Jeffrey Mumford, who's a phenomenal composer, right? They're just, that their works are really not um, um, featured in the way they should be. And one year um, I, I just scheduled a concert that I, just the pieces that I loved. And um, I realized when I made the program that they were all women. And people came up to me after the concert and they said, did you, did you decide to do all women? I mean, what was that? Was that the theme? And I said, no, I just, I just program pieces I love. <laughs> and they happen to be all women. And so um, that, that is a realization I've made in a few years that if I was going to make a list of all my favorite composers, of which all of you are on the list, I would... Uh, see that that list was at least women, and not because I'm thinking about women composers, but because that was really good. I mean, it's it's some of the best work that's being done, some of the most good work that's being done. I mean, I mean, I'd like to add to this list that that, that Mitzi Mensi can't. Um, people like uh, uh, Luna Wolf Pearl, who wrote Jackie, based on Jacqueline Day. And um, of course, Nakiro Okiaya, who wrote um, an opera about Harriet Mann. There are so many women writing operas now, and um, they're writing wow. out female heroines. And you know, the, for me, Artemisia was a really difficult subject, but I wanted to feature her art because I felt that 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 it needed to be, you know it needed to be highlighted. People needed to know who she was, they to know her work. And, um, and of course it's a very different story. That's an opera. A young woman gifted artist is raped. 
Um, her father her, takes the man on trial. He's prosecuted and found guilty, um, which is horrible, right? That's really me too, because she, you know, she made a stand. She's confirmed her truth in a, in a court of law where she was actually tortured with thumb screws. They broke her. And as a painter, that that was a horrible moment, right? And then she went on to an incredible career painting for kings um, and um, traveling the world. And if that doesn't bring us hope, you know, then what, what so, um, uh, but I agree with Missy that it's a very difficult thing to find right heroine for a story because so many of these stories of artists and tragically artists writers you know it, it, it's hard for them i mean artemisia was interesting writing um this this opera because artemisia was about my age i'm in my 50s and she was losing in that she's losing her eyesight and she knows when she loses her eyesight that she has her great love her one great love which is to create art and um, I think that all of us know that there is a cycle to careers as well. And, um, and there is a to some degree with youth, right? And Artemisia knows this as well. And so um, hitting middle age is very difficult for her. And the opera shows that arc of, of being the Wunderkind, being known as a, an artist by the time she's 17. And then then seeing her, 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 you know, career kind of off and then slowly but surely she's fighting with the bishops and the lords and the kids who are commissioning her because they want to chance her out of her fees. They say, oh, look, you're doing two figures. So we're going to pay you for one figure or you don't need that amount of money. And she's writing these furious letters to them, you know, defending her career, defending herself. So she can get money to be able to get cataract surgery. So, yeah, I, I'm probably up at my five minutes. That's, that's, that's great. Um, no, actually you brought up a lot of really interesting issues up, and the paintings are, are very beautiful. We should all, when we get out of these cages, we should take a field trip and go see this magnificent work at the Met. Um, I, I like that you brought up age like too. Um, and I think that's, oh, sorry. I was gonna say, I like to write it because, you know, I, I really am so happy this is a multi-generational panel. One thing that's great is you can kind of compose till you like, aren't here anymore, you know, Elliot Carter. Okay, great example, uh, among many others. So, um, you know, just we're, and, and also feeling that like shift, you know, I think that there's, um, we are fortunate, I should say, I think we are fortunate that we're in a field where we can keep creating, um, you know, challenges aside that we may be encountering, you know, as you, you know, keep going on in life. But, um, but that is really, I suppose, to a dancer, you know, that's, you can become a choreographer, but um, so very, very fortunate for all of us. I think that we can keep writing, but but it's an interesting question too, this obsession with with youth or, you know, like, and how do we approach, um, you know, the, the incredible importance of respect for who's come before us, you know, that's something so important to me, you know, just looking at, at the great role models, you know, in, here on the panel, both ways. I mean, I learned from my students too, as, as we all do. Um, so anyway, thank you for that. Um, okay, moving on to Zosha de Castri. So Zosha, welcome. Um, Zosha de Castri's work extends beyond purely concert music, including projects with electronics, sound arts, and collaborations with video and dance. She recently completed a commission titled Hunger for the Montreal Symphony. She is Canadian also, I didn't say that. Um, and uh, that was with improvised drummer. Uh, which is designed to accompany Peter Fuldus's 1973 silent film by the same name. She also wrote Long is the Journey, Short is the Memory for orchestra and chorus that opened the first night of the BBC proms featuring the BBC Symphony, the BBC Singers, and conductor Karina Kanalakis. Uh, Fenobello is a work that features five musicians, a large kinetic sound sculpture, electronics and video in a reflection on the influence of photography and phonography on human perception. Zosha, um, oh wait, did I say what you're work, currently working on? You, I didn't put it on my list. Okay, you're gonna tell us what you're currently working on. I know you're, there's a lot going on with you. You're incredibly busy, um, but um, I think I'm still I'm gonna ask you, 
Well, actually, tell, tell us right now, tell us what you're working, you know, what the next upcoming project is, and then I'm going to ask my question. Sure. Well, thanks again for having me on this fantastic panel. It's so inspiring to, to hear all of you speak. Um, but yeah, the next thing on my, on my agenda is to work on a commission for Chamber Music Society at Lincoln Center. So I'll be writing a piece with the same instrumentation as Quartet for the End of Time. Fantastic. It's a good pairing. Um, okay, so Zesha, when women were first visibly entering the field of music, uh, music composition, many veered towards electronic music because they could have complete independence, not to be, not be dependent on mainstream opportunities or mainstream venues and ensembles um, where they might not be welcome. And, um, you know, particularly I think can think of composers like Pauline Oliveros and Laurie Spiegel, uh, among others. Um, at the same time, you know, this, this afforded them a certain kind of independence. Um, the electronic music world was still largely dominated by male figures. Um, so you're incorporating really sophisticated technology into your large scale works. Um, and I'm wondering if you've experienced any barriers in particular related to being female working with technology in this way, or if you generally felt welcomed into that conversation. Sure, yeah, that's a great question to, to talk about. Um, maybe just to go back to this idea of history, since it seems to be a, a theme that we're interweaving between all of these questions. Um, I think that it's interesting, the examples you bring up of people like Pauline and, and Laurie, that um, of course, nowadays, technology is fairly accessible to a wider group of people. But I think in the earlier days, there's also a question of access. So when we think of those founding women, Wendy Carlos, um, yeah, they had this independence, but they were also tied to centers such as, you know, San Francisco Tape Center, uh, Bell Labs, Columbia Princeton Electronic Music Studio. So I think we have to always remember with technology, there's also a question of accessibility and who has access to those spaces. And to a certain degree, I think that's True now also, you know, as we move to having to teach from Zoom, we're realizing not every student, we can't assume that everybody has a good internet connection where they're coming from or that they have a personal laptop, depending on where they've been relocated to or what their circumstances are at home. So I think that's something to continue thinking about how it affects um, how we're thinking about technology and music. Um, and then also tying into this idea of history, the idea of who's who's writing these histories um, that we're learning. And I think that's something that I relate to really strongly with technology. And I've been talking to colleagues about, um, you know, most, I was lucky that I studied at McGill University in Columbia and we had a strong electronic music curriculum that was required classes for all composers. So I got sort of a strong foundation from the beginning. Um, but in terms of which pieces are taught or what you learn about, you know, it wasn't until recently that I discovered the, the book Pink Noises by Tara Rogers and have been learning more about that. And I remember when I came into the studios at Columbia feeling like maybe I was one of the first women to set foot in that space. And then gradually over time uncovering there's this whole history of people who've been doing work there for whatever, 70 years. It's just not really advertised that way. Um, so together with uh, Professor Ali Hassama, we're working to create a symposium in the next year or so that would address those sort of untold histories, because I think it's so important for students in particular to know that there is a lineage there and that you are part of a larger story. Um, so that's something I, I'm committed to. Uh, but to talk back to your point about whether there are certain barriers that have been uh, felt. I, I mean, I use technology for a lot of different things in my music. I use it even when I'm writing purely instrumental music, I will use the computer as a tool, not the only thing. I mean, I play the piano and I still use pencil and paper, but I think that it, it has uh, useful applications for me. I write mixed music where I have ensembles and electronics, and then I've been doing more sort of interdisciplinary um, projects with different art forms. Um, so it, it has different uses for different pieces for me. Um, I think earlier on when I was starting out, I faced more more sort of questioning about my place using technology and music nowadays. I feel like that happens less, which is good. Hopefully <laughs> that will continue for people. I, you know, having teachers say, did, did you write this piece with electronics or did your partner help you with that? Or did somebody else, you know, assuming that you couldn't figure it out yourself, uh, things like that can be very discouraging when you're just beginning. Um, uh, and then I think, also thinking about the, the physical spaces that we inhabit in studios, 
you know, sometimes walking in and being like, there's socks and McDonald's containers here. And this really doesn't feel like a, a place where I'm, I'm meant to be or that any woman has ever walked before. <laughs> um, so that's something that I've been thinking about with uh, some of our graduate students. And I, I think it's great that people are taking initiative to think, how can we make this an accessible space that feels welcoming to a wide range of people, people who have a lot of expertise, people who have never done anything but are curious, uh, you know, people from different racial backgrounds or class background, you know, all these things to take that into consideration, how we can make it a, a welcoming space. Um, so I think that, that, that that's nice. And at, currently at the Computer Music Center at Columbia, there's this great DIY culture and a, a very a community sense of people supporting one another. Um, so I, I'm happy to see that happening. I think that even in the time that I've been in New York, I've been here, what, 10 or 11 years now, I've seen a change there and who is occupying those spaces and how, how they're using them and how they're supporting one another. So I th think that's really positive. Um, and also who's teaching those classes, because now we have um, a lot of female TAs and instructors, and I'm seeing more than 50% of the students taking the classes are now women. There's a lot of curiosity there. I think just having that visibility and representation can really help people feel like this is something I could try to do, or this is something that is um, interesting and, uh, and approachable. Um, I just wanted to add one more thing that that is, um, I think in terms of thinking about technology in my own work, moving away from this idea of artist as genius, that you have to do everything yourself, uh, this kind of historical idea, um, that that's sort of outdated. And there are a lot of different ways that we can function and interact with technology. Um, so, and that will vary from project to project. So sometimes I can do everything on my own and sometimes it makes sense to have a team. I'm sure, you know, an opera that you face that as well, um, having somebody to help out with certain aspects and it's okay to say, well, that's not my area of expertise. I'm gonna bring somebody in who specializes in video so I can focus on the music. And seeing that as a, as a shared collaboration can also be a really productive um, and stimulating way to create new works. Tasha, thank you. And I really love that you brought in the uh, idea of accessibility, you know, mm -hmm. um, what people have access to and, and who's encouraged to use it. Um, I do think, you know, a number of people have brought up who's teaching, you know, mm -hmm. well, that's really changed, you know, and, and, and that's a very, very important change. I think that's huge. Um, yeah. And just to say, on oh, a tiny personal story, I remember being in, in music school and, and, and going to the uh, electronic music studio and saying, I don't know anything about this. So I would be that person you just mentioned, like someone who's curious and, and they, oh, oh no, don't, if you haven't started yet. And there were women working in that area that it wasn't like there were no women, but I was like the novice looking to, to learn that. And were, you know, if you haven't started yet, don't bother. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, really? Like, you know, so I didn't, so I didn't, you know? And so I, yeah. a little bit technologically with a challenge. And so I, I also, it's a really good point that the use of computers in, in, in writing, I, I, mm -hmm. I live with this desktop here, you know? so. Um, I think there are many ways we interact with technology, but the accessibility is, is such an important issue. And so, yeah, we appreciate you bringing that up. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, definitely, last but definitely not least, I'd like to turn to Tanya, Tanya Leon. Um, so Tanya Leon is highly regarded as a composer and conductor and recognized for her accomplishments as an educator and advisor to arts organizations. She's been profiled on ABC, CBS, CNN, PBS, Univision, Telemundo, and independent films. Leon's opera, Scourge of Hyacinths, was staging and designed by Robert Wilson, received over 20 performances throughout Europe and Mexico. This work took home Munich's coveted BMW Prize. Commissions include works for the Los Angeles Philharmonic, the International Contemporary Ensemble, Orpheus Chamber, Orchestra, New World Symphony, List goes on. <laughs> many, many things. Cincinnati Symphony, NDR Symphony Orchestra, Ensemble Modern, Los Angeles Masters Chorale, uh, the Los Angeles uh, Philharmonic, among others. Okay. Um, recent commissions include the score for the opera The Little Rock Nine, with the libretto by Thelani Davis, and historical research by Henry Louis Gates Jr., commissioned by the University of Central Arkansas College of Fine Arts and Communication. Um, and Tanya, you are currently, I didn't write your, okay, you're, Tanya, you're gonna tell us what you're currently working on. And then I'm gonna ask my question. What are you working on right now? 
Okay, I'm working uh, with Carlos Pintado. I mean, he's a poet, president in Miami, and also born in Cuba. And I am working on a piece, which is going to be a song cycle for soprano and string quartet and piano. And that is uh, commissioned by the Musical Fund Society of Philadelphia for its bicentennial. So um, the performance uh, will be May 2nd, 2021. And then I'm, I'm working on the sketches also uh, for the Stuart Gardner Museum, uh, which actually um, has commissioned me for a quintet. And that will be actually um, performed or premiere at the museum in Boston. And uh, Fantastic. So. so it sounds like it's a productive time, regardless <laughs> of being in uh -huh. <laughs> the four walls. Uh -huh. Fantastic. Okay, here's your question. Um, so Tanya, in a recent conversation, uh, we were on a panel together um, on race and representation. You mentioned that you fit into all the prejudicial categories that people are discussing. You are a woman, you are a person of color, you're an immigrant. Um, I've heard you say that looking out of the window of an airplane, you see no borders, only land and sea that connects us all. It was a beautiful erasure of divisions. Um, at the same time, you've broken through all the barriers to become one of the most celebrated figures in American music. Um, does cultural or female identity have meaning in the music that you're writing or the subjects that you choose to address? Um, if, if yes or no, or has that changed for you over time? Are these issues uh, uh, different now than they were when you first started writing music? Uh, well, um, I started writing music late because I arrived here as a pianist, I never thought that I would be part of this discussion today. And uh, I'm honored by all of my colleagues. You know, I, I respect and admire them. And uh, they are mentors, whether they are younger or older than I am, you know, because I mean, each of them is a trajectory. But um, uh, I uh, was fortunate to start as a charter member of the Dance Theatre of Harlem. And that is where I was given the opportunity to write a ballet. And then from then, the whole thing actually, uh, I saw myself in front of Ursula Mamluk, and I never thought that um, she was a woman composer. She was a composer. And I started going into every single venue in Manhattan, you know, and that is how I bumped into Pauline Olivares. And I, of course, I mean, in one of the panels, one of my first panels for the New York State Council on the Arts, I, I found the gigantic figure of Joan Tower, you know, which is actually the one that taught me how to uh, come out of my child. Uh, ditch. Um, uh, I, I was very, very shy, you see. And uh, jo it was Joan, the one that in a way helped me out, you know, to propel myself out. And uh, of course, Orson Mitchell at Dan Siedro Harlan, they were the ones that work on my Chinese. And now, I mean, you know, I'm hard to stop, you know, <laughs> people say, shut up, you see, <laughs> because I, I, I'm uncontrollable. But uh, the situation of identity is that uh, my identity is very fluid. You know, I never, um, it, it, it might sound very crazy, but I have never been sold on the specificity of the different categories that we have actually lumped human beings into. I mean, the people of color, I would like to do a concert and I have done a concert of people of color that included every single color, meaning every time, I mean, every uh, skin tone, you see. I mean, cause that's for me is people of color. That's how I grew up. And uh, my family was the first example of that pictures of an exhibition that I didn't know that I was going to be actually defending in the future, you see. And I love the fact that one of my colleagues mentioned the fact that, that you know, Jeffrey Mumford is a good composer or is an extraordinary composer, but the qualification that we do is a black composer. What is a black composer? What is a woman composer? What is, I mean, these are incredible composers in the physical form of a woman on the physical form of somebody that is wearing a skin tone that is darker than another one. So that's where I'm coming from and that's how I have been able to navigate all of the different titles that I have had every time I, I am introduced. I have been introduced as a rare bird, you know? <laughs> I mean, uh, Latina, uh, Afro-Latina, 
um, Afro-American, um, you know, five foot two. Uh, you see, <laughs> and even the clothes that I wear, you see, but the thing is that it, it really doesn't bother me. I mean, I think that, you know, I always, always mention my ancestors because I think that they prepare me for what had become for me Alice in Wonderland. I never, never in my wildest imagination, I thought I was gonna become a composer and that it would be actually part of this conversation today. So that's one of the things. The other thing is that, you know, of course, I mean, we are going to, um, through a tremendous amount of pandemia, you know, in the world right now. And I don't say the pandemia of a virus. I mean, there's many kinds of pandemias going on at the same time. And we are all navigating these as composers. I mean, how to how to cement, you know, the history of what is happening right now for generations to come. I mean, it's being portrayed in our music. It's being portrayed in composers that write about people that are still alive, you know, like Laura Kaminsky with her, I mean, opera as one. I mean, it's about a transgender that is alive and is attending the performances. You know, and, 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 and you, for example, when I was at the Philharmonic with your incredible piece, you know, and, and those women with those sewing machine, you see, and what you were able to do with the sound in order to portray and hit the audience with what was going to happen. And uh, I, I have to talk about this moment, the, 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 the most poignant moment in my life recently it was when the, the celebration of the beginning of the Project 19 that I wrote that piece called Stride for Susan B. Anthony. And the fact that it was the same day that Susan B. Anthony became a hundred years. But that is not the point. My point is that I saw myself like my other colleagues talking to an audience of the, of the city that, that made me, the city that saw me grow up you see, and that all of the composers that were in the audience, that was the most important moment. And I, I'm pretty sure that it happened to you as well. Because I mean, we saw each other after the performance and, and it was an exhilarating moment because the green room was full of composers. And it was composers of every skin tone, every persuasion, composers, you see. And that is something that I, uh, I you know, I am grateful to uh, the universe that have given me this opportunity to talk to all of you and to be a member of a community of artists in the world that we are trying to do something to see if we can have a better dialogue and we start bringing down all the incredible barriers that we have built, you know, to separate us because it doesn't work. Thank you, Tanya. I do want to say it was a really great moment. It was great to hear you speak um, on that stage also, uh, and then hear your piece, which was magnificent. Um, yeah, I mean, it's so funny. I mean, I sometimes you wonder, well, should we all define ourselves by being like where we are? Are we like the oldest kid in the family? Or are we like an only child? You know, there are all these other ways we could completely define. Maybe my, maybe our music is because of uh, we grew up in a small town. Or I mean, there's so many different ways. We're, 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 like Missy was saying, we're these complex beings, not only characters in, in what we portray, but also ourselves. You know, we're, we're such a, a mix of our lives and experiences. I always, you know, share with my students, well, you know, if you go hiking up that mountain, it's gonna also affect your music. You know, I mean, it's just, we're, we're a, a reflection of the time we're in and, and what our lives are. And, um, so, well, we, we, we did pretty darn good. Like, I feel like we, we heard everyone and, um, you know, in a really very deep and beautiful way. Um, and we still have time for questions, which is great. Um, Cause I really think it's nice to open up to the audience. Um, and welcome them in. This is just going to be really open. Anybody can jump in and answer, you know, just give each other space. Um, I have some questions that came in that were written down. Um, I'm just going to start with those. We'll see how far we get. And then certainly if there are more questions coming in from everybody out there, uh, I think Joseph will help us field those. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, the first one. Um, this was a question sent in. To what extent has the field of composition changed for women over the past? This is a multi 
uh, question. Question: um, To what extent has the field of composition changed for women over the past 50 years? Are there hurdles that existed back then that don't exist today? Are there hurdles today that didn't exist back then, um, like new hurdles? Um, are there differences in this between America and the rest of the world? So that's something actually we didn't get into. So maybe we start with the tail end of the several questions there. This question of, does anyone have a perception that there's a difference in the US um, as opposed to say, you know, Europe or um, Scandinavia or any other location? Um, how, how are we doing here in the US? Anyone wanna jump in on that? Don't all yell at once. <laughs> Well, who is just in Europe? <laughs> Anybody share their perception of, sort of I guess, how I women are perceived there or, or how active there? So Joan, just like Joan's making an effort there with her. Do you want to unmute? Oh, there you go. Uh, I, I'm not going to talk about the Europe thing okay. about, because uh, I think people have better experience with that than I do. Um, the music doesn't always go across the ocean. I noticed that too, both ways, right? <laughs> But I think during the last 50 years, she was asking, Yeah, we have come a long ways, a very long ways, which I've been there <laughs> with the 50 years. We have books now written about biographies. We have recordings. We have uh, women writing for orchestra, which in my day, there were no women writing for orchestra. Uh, we have operas now, major operas. Congratulations, Missy, on the Met thing. That's, and then I think you're one of the, you're the second, maybe third, tied for first. <laughs> oh, with uh, uh, the the records, right? With with um, yeah. So um, third, it's so the Met has performed two operas by women. So Ethel Smythe, the records, and Kaiser Aho, L'Amour de Luen, But they've never. I'm the first commission along with Janine Tesori. So wow. it'll be third performance, but first commissions were the two of us together. Bravo. That's a major, major event. Uh, Thank you. The Wreckers is a fantastic piece. And why that has died, its death is way beyond me. You, you saw that, right? Did you see it? I, I've never seen it, but I, I've oh. heard it. Yeah. You got to check it out. Yeah. It's an amazing piece. Amazing piece. And so we've, We've really come a long, long ways, but un unfortunately we still have a ways to go as all of you are talking about. I mean, I've learned so much about the technological world, the opera world, these are worlds I don't travel in. And it was so interesting to hear. That's why I think these panels are very important because we learn so much from each other. You know? uh, so um, yeah, we've come a long ways, but we still have a ways to go. Laura, yeah. You have to unmute yourself there. Oh, yes. And my, okay. Um, I, 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 I think this um, discussion is really fascinating as you're talking about identity, because identities aren't always known to people by what you see, right? So I don't know if you know that I was born in Ciudad de Mexico. I'm, I was born in Mexico, all right? And I'm Jewish, and I also have a bohemian background. So I am I am an American mutt, right? I am all these things. Am I am I Latinx? Am I am I you know I look like this white lady with blonde hair, right? By the way, this is not my real hair color, but um, I've been all colorful, red. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, I think that ID is one of those things that is really fluid. Tanya's right. And different people to sometimes see you in different ways. So I, I'll get these, these letters from people saying, we want to do your piece as we read you were born in Mexico and we're just doing Latin American composers, right? Or um, we hear you're a Jewish composer. So we're doing Jewish music and we'd like to put this concert. And, and, and the thing is, is I love those barriers, as yes. I said, to be very fluid, to, to include every background. You know? And um, I just wanted to make that point. It's not always obvious who we are and who are inside, you know? Yeah. Uh, like Laura Kaminsky did this fabulous opera on Halo, right? And, and so that, that the, 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 
exemplifying and the and the and the featuring of women all sorts of different backgrounds even even if it's not obvious i think is a really important part of what we should be doing in our missions thank you did anyone i, I, I know the couple of questions about the europe question i know a bunch of you lived in europe for a period of time or you know missy yeah i i mean i just i can just speak briefly about it and you know i uh lived in the netherlands for two years um you know now it's a long time ago like in 2002 to 2004 um and just you know to make a huge generalization um you know my sense there was that you know it's uh less of an issue and that the numbers are better um in the conservatory in the hague uh you know there was a a large number of female composers many more than i ever saw in my studies in america America, um, but that the discussion was less evolved, actually, um, because it was sort of assumed in, the, in, a, in a country that's perceived as very progressive, like the Netherlands, that um, sexism and racism are not a problem. And they're actually huge problems. And so there was less of a language with which to talk about these issues, you know, and there were several like competitions in the Netherlands that were completely judged by men and every single person on the, the composition faculty in the conservatory in The Hague uh, was a man. Um, and that has since changed with Kali Opisupaki is now teaching there just to shout her out. But like, you know, so it's, uh, that was just, you know, something to contribute that I think it's, it's um, uh, yeah, it's let, the numbers are better. The equality is a little bit more there, but the discussion is much less evolved in my experience. I also found that, um, yeah, much earlier, other than and also in the Netherlands, which is quite an incredible musical place to, to be for a while, um, that, I think by the time that you got there, the music school was, it sounds like much, much more diverse. I don't know whether it translates to the, to the professional moment. Like um, I, I, I'm so aware of American women composing and I know, I do know some uh, Dutch women composing also, but not as somehow for me, it might be my generation, they weren't as visible. I think that's changed. Um, but I remember thinking, well, all these women back, back home writing music and and there I didn't see them the years I was there in the early 90s so hopefully it's evolved I, I, I think I see it more in Russia the Russian women if you take it as my storm you know in Eastern Europe really strong presence but somehow like Germany um, not that there aren't figures they're very powerful figures but I see less um, than 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 in the, on the professional level than, than the states but you know again these are perceptions that's not like a study and I know Zosha you seem to spend a lot to work a lot in, yeah. in Europe Does, do you have any response to how you're interacting in, in that context or? I mean it's been somewhat limited but I have lived in Paris twice in 2006 and then just recently in 2018-19 um, so I, I, I do think that the discussion is different how it's being had in different countries my experience as, as an outsider in Paris both looking at the Conservatoire and places like IRCAM, which is a technological center for music, is it's still very male dominated. And when they have a program, it's very featured in this sort of, this is a special <laughs> type of concert. Um, so that, yeah, that, that feels a little bit uh, more behind to me. I think also maybe that comes from this culture of, you know, in the States often you'll be asked in um, surveys, how do you identify it? And there's problems with that, as we've mentioned, that our identities are fluid or, you know, it can't just always fit into one box. But in France, one thing that surprised me as a student was that that's really not okay. You, like, you cannot ask, you know, what, what is your race or like, that, that goes against their idea of, of, of what you, your freedoms are. Um, but by not knowing, that doesn't necessarily address the problem either. Um, so that I think changes the conversation over there. And then maybe just to quickly note on, on Canada, um, there are so many really wonderful and prominent women um, composing and that growing up that, that was really inspiring doing my undergraduate seeing those success stories and maybe one of the differences there is the, the, the model for funding of the arts. Um, the way the Canada Council works, for instance, that's always peer reviewed that they do a really good job, at least in the experience that I've had of having a, a jury that has diversity built into it in every way that you can think, you know, geographically and gender and uh, race and ethnicity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'd be curious to look also at that, how things like the way that we fund the arts also affects who's getting heard, who's getting commissioned, who's being supported, uh, whose music is played. Um, 
that's just yeah where I'm coming from. Okay, maybe I'll look at one of these other questions here. Um, some of them are hard to answer. <laughs> I think uh, one is what steps do you think need to be taken to achieve equity in the classical music industry? It's big. That's a big question. But if anybody wants to jump in with a concrete, concrete effort that can that could be made to to create greater equity. Tanya. <laughs> All right. Um, that is a very, um, very complex. Um, it's a complex question. And uh, to create equity, uh, we don't have to create it. We have it. We all have equity. The only thing is that how to acknowledge the equity that each of us have and how through equity then paired to inclusion, then we have something that really could work. Okay, you might know an artist of any denomination at this point, I would call, you know, it could be a transgender, it could be, you know, an artist of color or an artist of, of Latin American descent or Turkish descent or whatever. And uh, it's not about where the person come from, where is, you know, the cultural background, how the person looks, you know, but the thing is that the essence of that person, what is the value, the intrinsic value of that person? If you are looking for a musician, what is the intrinsic value as a musician, as a voice, you see? And then if that is, if that person is invited into the conversation and to sit at the table and lean in, then the equity grows. And that is what actually is the seeds of what we call diversity. So without people being of different walks of life, being actually uh, accepted for their equity work, for the value that a person has to contribute to the bigger conversation, then we don't have to talk about diversity because we have been diverse since the planet, you know, emerged with human beings, what we call the human being, you see? So it's, it's I, you know, I hear the word diversity and I have always been um, bothered about it. Because I mean, we talk about diversity and right now, I mean, the world is looking for people of color because what had happened just recently of all the rallies, you know, all of the nation and in the world. So it's like all of a sudden the equity of these people of color that perhaps we knew that were there, now they become part of the conversation because what is happening. It's exactly what Joan said about the Me Too. All of a sudden, where is a woman, you see? So we can have that conversation. So we can include that woman. All of a sudden the equity of that woman have gone up to the roof. So, I mean, that, that is my humble opinion about that. And this is one of the things that I would like to reiterate of why my identity is very fluid. Because it constantly, you know, emerging into something. I mean, it's like a me metamorphosis, you know, changing like a chameleon in order to adapt to what is going on and, and, and find my own equity to how to contribute to whatever is being discussed or whatever is necessary. Um, it's very complicated and, and Tanya's point of view is so well taken and so well represented by the, well, first of all, Chamber of Music America did a whole thing on equity. Uh, uh, the, the league did a whole thing on equity. The word equity suddenly got in the title of their annual presentation. But when you, ask about classical music first of all who are you talking about are you talking about the dead white europeans are you talking about new music are you talking are you talking about multicultural you know where where does that line go because all of those things have structures and the quote classical music world of the dead white european male has a structure to it, right? And I deal with that world a lot. Um, 
there's the conservatories, there's the universities, and they all are teaching 80% Oh, wait. And just for the what we've been with for the last hundred years, until about that has its own structure. And so, I yeah. know that the world has other structure. The other world has. Am I frozen? Am now I frozen? Back. Now you're back. Your voice just came back. You, you got a little garbled, but I, I, I think that we got the thread, which was that what are we te we're teaching? First of all, that these areas are very defined. Um, you know, a white, a white male European tradition is kind of the has been the mainstay of conservatories, um, and the mainstay of classical education. Yeah, and so uh, a place like a place like Chamber Music America, which which is an umbrella for the uh, Chamber Music field, is trying to. Uh, it has been including jazz in their structure, which has made it a very different organization. Because now we're seeing we're they're mixing the two together, which is very interesting to see how these two are learning from each other. Right, that kind of structure, I think, it can be very useful. Not not everybody likes that, you know. And jazz took forever to get into the university, right? So I, I think when you ask the question of how is new music doing in terms of equity, you have to talk about the structure. What, which structure are you talking about? This is a really big conversation going on at everybody teaching at schools right now. Um, what, what should the education be? You know, um, and, and I think it's a great moment. You know, it's a painful moment in the country, but I think it's a really great moment to stop and make change and talk about what, yeah, what's required? Do, you like, do we all need to have this very set way of learning music theory? You know, incredible things that people have learned through classical, you know, Western uh, European music. Great, you know, but what is the education? What's the whole picture? And what's useful to these young kids performing and composing? And, um, you know, what, what tools are useful? And just, just opening that conversation up so that there, the education isn't so old fashioned, I guess, you know, in a certain sense, but also so narrow, you know, and so I think this is a very healthy moment. Um, it's painful, I think, for some people as well, but it's really, really important to examine what the heck is an education or what can it be and, and, and how students can also gravitate towards the tools they need for what they want to say. And I see Jesse's jumping in there. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted, I just wanted to jump in and um, in a way sort of reiterate one of my earlier points, which is, which is that um, just this question of, um, of how do you change, you know, and how do you, and now we're talking about in, in an educational setting and in, in these educational institutions, I think it's an, an, a great moment to start asking yourself, what is it that I want to know? What is it that I think I don't know? And what is it that I, what am I trying to learn about women composers, about black composers, about, about, my, about my own identity within this art form that I'm that I'm working with, and I feel like that's that's just like an opening statement um, that we can sort of start each lesson with. Let's call it a classroom lesson, or whatever, or a board meeting, or whatever sort of uh, whatever the context is. But that question of what what is your relationship to um, equity or to identity? What is your why why do you care? And what does it mean to you? And then starting to sort of ask the answer these questions for yourself, um, I think we'll um, start to then we can be the better, better contributors to this uh, moment that's uh, moving forward. It's also giving validity to, to different. I mean, I think like Missy started her own group. You know, she's working in a band context. You know, um, I was like, you know, a hippie child playing American folk music before, um, you know, coming into this more formal, you know classical music world and so uh most of us are pretty are pretty much of a mixed bag you know in terms of where do we come from and what was our education it, it, it would, and then we, we almost feel like oh i'm sorry i don't know enough you know mm -hmm. i've certainly been in that ca category of, oh yeah I'm, I'm missing some pieces in my education and those pieces were like these very specific things i don't think i know enough music history or i like i do i know theory and like these weird pressures it's like well i know all this other stuff that i was really interested in you know and i went right. and, and, and learned it you know and got into it you know totally separate from some outside voice telling you 
quick. So I like this idea of like, what are your tools and what do you need? Um, asking yourself that, that's really, and hopefully we'll hear back from younger people what they wanna, what they wanna learn. I also add just in, um, you know, for me, any discussion of equity or moving towards a more equal field is has to include early education. Um, you know, it, I've traveled around the country for over 10 years, you're teaching, doing guest teaching, and I rarely ever see a, a freshman class that is um, in any way sort of equal in terms of gender and certainly not in terms of race or other factors. And um, I think that there's some that tells me that something's happening to young people in their teens is discouraging them from entering the field. And so I think um, that's why I started my program Luna Labs, which is pay special attention to people at that sort of critical age of 13 to 19, which is when you often, that's often the age when people decide to be a professional musician and providing extra space and extra help um, for those people at that age. And also providing a space where they can just talk to um, their female peers. Um, which is so important to have at least like, you know, like 10% of your musical activity be with people who look like you. So I think that that's also an essential part of it and getting upping the numbers of people who are going to college and sort of entering the, the system, you know, for lack of a better term, um, who are, are women. Definitely. I, mean, I think for all of us universities, um, I, I can't speak for everybody, but um, the application pool is is way weighted towards men and women. I, I, I'd like, to, where are they? <laughs> you know, um, definitely. I, I have to just check in on the time. I don't know, Joseph, if you wanted less. There's some great questions in the chat. I see we can't, yeah. I can get to everything. Are we supposed to stop at 1.30? Is that our end one thirty point? Eastern. Yeah, just to respect all of Eastern. your time. I, there's, if okay. everyone wants to keep going, I think that would be okay, but maybe it's better just to stick to our time. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll try, I don't, maybe we'll just ask everyone if there's any, uh, closing. I'm sorry we didn't get to every question. Um, certainly, one question was um, what what resources are, and a bunch of people have mentioned really interesting resources. Um, maybe what I could do is is give those to Joseph at the Aspen Music Festival. Um, you know, books from everything from the books Joan that you read in the 1960s. You know, I mean, just whatever whatever really um, impacted you. Um, I think by resources they meant um, maybe lists of where to have access to music. Um, uh, anything that kind of illuminates this conversation that's it's like hard copy kind of thing. Um, I'll, I'm happy to gather that too and, and share that because that was one, one request. Um, if I could just a uh, point of information, every, anyone who'd like to save, the recording will be available for a week uh, streaming of this conversation. And uh, if you'd like to save the chat, the text chat, you're able to do that. Uh, looking at the ellipsis, the three dots uh, to the right of, uh, uh, the upper right hand corner of your chat box um so everyone can have that themselves great oh, so i don't know if it was saved that's great you, know, you all didn't know you're being recorded but sorry i should have said that right at the start um but anyway i just want to thank everybody it really was fun i mean even leading into this touching through the wires you know to just touch base with everybody in this very strange moment um but so inspiring to hear everybody and to see everybody is really heartwarming. And um, so just a big thank you to the panel and uh, and share it with your friends. Yeah, if you're happy with well, what we all talked about, um, we'll, we'll find out where it's being posted and then we'll just share it with um, anyone who didn't get to tune in today. All right, be well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.